You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. In today's episode, John is joined by Geraint Lewis. Born in Old South Wales, Geraint Lewis is a professor of astrophysics at the Sydney Institute for Astronomy, part of the University of Sydney's School of Physics. His research focuses on the dark side of the universe, the matter and energy that shapes our cosmos. Dr Lewis is a teacher, an author and science communicator. As well as two books on cosmology, he has published more than 400 papers in international refereed journals. Dr. Lewis's new book, co-authored with Ferry Chris, is titled Where Did the Universe Come From? and Other Cosmic Questions, Our Universe from the Quantum to the Cosmos. Event Horizon and my channel are now available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube memberships. Early ad-free episodes, bonus episodes, and sleep-focused content. Sign up now by clicking the links below to your platform of choice. Professor Garant Lewis, welcome to the program. Hello. Now, Professor, you are from South Wales, the original, and you have moved to New South Wales in Australia. Does this evoke thoughts of parallel universes in, in your mind? Not the fact that I'm in New South Wales, because New South Wales is actually very different to Old South Wales. I mean, where I grew up in Britain uh, is uh, definitely not as sunny, is a lot rainier than here. So it, it, it is a very different place. And parallel universes, in my mind, though, are, are something which I do think about a lot in terms of cosmology. I think that these are possible things that are out there, but uh, like all good cosmological ideas, this is somewhat in the realm of speculation and hard science at the moment. Do you think we'll ever be able to test these various ideas of parallel universes of which we have the idea of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, but we also have this idea of the multiverse. So there are two different ways to have parallel universes. Do you think any of this is testable? Well, well, firstly, I think there's more than just two ways of having parallel universes. Even with the multiverse idea, there are different kinds of multiverse. We have, of course, the potential that our universe itself, a single universe, is infinite in extent. And there are chunks of universe out there that we may never have causal contact with, where the laws of physics could be very different to the laws of physics here. So that is one kind of multiverse. But there is another kind of multiverse above that where... There's not just our universes, but there's other universes out there that might even have a similar structure. Now, the question of whether this is testable is an interesting one, because the problem we have is that we can naively imagine this picture of parallel universes and we can say, oh, that we're causally disconnected. So therefore, they're always beyond the reach of experimentation. But until a multiverse idea becomes a, a scientific theory in the sense that there is a strong mathematical basis that, that you know, I mean, that's what a physicist needs to in interrogate an idea is the mathematics of the situation. We just don't know. We just do not know what the influence of one universe on another universe might be. We, I said, we, ha we have this picture that they could be causally disconnected, but there could be ways that universes do interact and there have been speculations, claims that our cosmic microwave background may have a bit of a pattern in it, which indicates that our universe was born in a collision with another universe sometime in the past. I mean, I think these are, I said, these are not very well supported ideas, but people are thinking about could other universes influence this universe? But until we have a I said a robust mathematical theory, it's, it's speculation more than anything. So we, we don't know. Now, in regards to the anthropic principle of which you have worked with, the anthropic principle sort of almost implies a multiverse, because if this universe is moderately fine-tuned for life, it can happen. Although there are some that have worked out that it could be better. 
But if this universe is fine tuned for life, then we simply won the lottery and we're in the right universe with the right laws of physics to support life and intelligence. But that would imply there are many universes that are not, and we just simply won the lottery. So if there's only one universe, it looks really strange, but if there are many, not so strange, right? Yeah, so so as you said, this is something that I've, I've thought about quite a bit, and I wrote a book on this, this very topic, uh, this notion that our, our universe can host life, and of course, we, we, we should expect ourselves to, to find ourselves in such a universe. The, the question in my mind is not really about life, though. This is because this is where the argument sometimes goes off the rails when people take the anthropic principle to mean people. For me, the question is complexity, right? The universe hosting complexity. So in our universe, right, we have 92 natural elements and we can use those uh, to build molecules and molecules have different shapes and structures. And we are basically molecular machines where molecules interact in. And the question is, where does that complexity come from? Okay, so why do we have a periodic table with 92 natural elements in there? You can, you can work out that, that the existence of the periodic table is a, something that's implied by the relative strengths of the fundamental forces, right? To, to have an atom, you've got to have a nucleus which is held together. And that, that nucleus has a strong force which is pulling it together, and electromagnetism which is forcing it apart. And you've got to have electromagnetism to hold the electrons in place. And you've also got the weak force, which causes uh, you know, aspects of radioactive decays. So to have a stable, long-lived periodic table is a balance between those forces. And if you start to mess around with those forces, then you find that you can rapidly wipe out that complexity. So if you have a, a universe where molecules can't form, say we only had helium in the universe, helium is a, an element that's just doesn't form molecules because it's just you know, a very stable atom, then there, there's no prospect for complexity and then there's no prospect for life, right? So, so it's a question of complexity. And as you mentioned, when we look at the laws of physics, it's very easy to think of ways of building a universe without the required complexity for life. And the question is why? why would we find ourselves in a universe that has allowed this complexity to be here? And you can either just sort of go shrug my shoulders and say, that's just the way it is. But personally, I find that as a you know particularly unsatisfying kind of answer. And so you, you have to delve into the possibilities and the, one of the possibilities, and in my mind, the, the most scientific of the possibilities is this notion that our universe is not the only universe in the sense that our universe is generated by some mechanism that generates universes and each universe gets stamped by with its laws of physics as it's created. And we were the ones, as you said, won the lottery. We got the mix of physics that allows us to be here. But that, as you also implied, that means that there must be many, many other universes that have been created, which are basically dead and sterile. And so, you know, this is a hard question to, to answer about, you know, what fraction of universes can host complexity. But looking at the laws of physics, it would seem that we, we would be exceedingly rare in that ensemble of possible universes to have universes that have complexity in life. So, yeah, what we do with that information now is, I, I think, is, a, is, a, is an interesting one. Some people don't even like to think of this notion of the multiverse because they said that they have this idea in their mind that it's untestable. Therefore, you know, it's just speculation. But, you know, what we're trying to do is develop uh, theories, which are multiverse theories that we want to be able to test down the line somewhere. And these theories have to produce universes like our own. And, and once we have those theories, we'll sort of know how rare or common complexity in life would be across the, the multiverse. At the moment, we don't really know. We think it's exceedingly rare. Another question, which happens to be the title of your new book, where did the universe come from and other cosmic questions, our universe from the quantum to the cosmos. Now that's a heck of a question. Where did the universe come from? And do we ever have any hope of understanding what generated the big bang and our universe as we know it? Uh, well, my hope is that we, we, will, we will understand this one day. I mean, we, we know why we don't know. I mean, this is, the, this is the important part. We know where we fall over. 
And this is one of the reasons that we wrote the book in the first place is that modern science or modern physics, I should say, is built on two pillars, right? On one hand, we have general relativity, Einstein's vision of gravity. And it is a classical theory in the sense that it describes space time as this continuous thing, which can be warped and bent and you get gravity and it, it works exceedingly well, right? Relativity is a theory that's been tested to the nth degree. On the flip side, we have quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics, of course, you know, everybody talks about the weirdness of quantum mechanics, but again, as a mathematical theory, it is highly successful, right? It, it makes predictions and those predictions are borne out. And written in into our quantum theories these days are the other three fundamental forces, electromagnetism, weak force, and strong force. But they are quantum forces and say so they are written in the language of probability and particle exchange and all this kind of stuff. And we therefore have these two highly successful theories, gravity, quantum mechanics, and they are just different mathematics, okay? So, you know, we've got classical sort of maths over here of fields, etc. And on the other side, you've got the quantum maths and probability and that kind of stuff. And what we don't know is how we get those two forces, to uh, two theories to play together nicely. It's where we think gravity and the other forces are essentially vying for dominance are the interesting places where we have questions yet to answer. So that, you know, for a cosmologist, there is that question about where did the universe come from? And we know that as we run the clock backwards, the universe gets hotter and hotter and denser and denser. We see that in the very, very early universe, you have gravity and you have the other forces and they are, they are essentially fighting for dominance in the early universe. And we don't have the mathematics to explain exactly how the universe behaves in that kind of situation. What we're looking for, you know, and this has been a search for, oh, you know, as long as I can remember, uh, you know, this, this either you know, quantum theory of gravity or this theory of everything, grand unified theory, where we can write everything in a single mathematical framework. Because without that maths, that it, then all we can sort of do is guess, right? We can sort of say, right, I'm going to take this theory and I'm going to take this theory. I'm going to sort of stick them together. It kind of works, but I, I don't know if I really trust it. But my hope is, is that once that nut is cracked, once somebody somewhere sorts out how you make the four fundamental forces work within a single mathematical framework, then that door, which is preventing us seeing where the universe came from, will be opened. We will understand, and I'm not saying that we will understand everything, but we will understand a, a lot more about the, the very birth of our universe and what came before, right? Was it re truly the birth of a universe from nothing? which, you know, Lawrence Krauss has written about? Or is it that our universe branched off from some other space-time structure that occurred before us? So I, I do hope that we can work that out one day, but, you know, we are still facing the, the challenge that we've been facing for 50, 60, 70 years on how you can unify gravity with the other forces. This also holds something that is pretty exciting because and, and I, you'll, you'll, as a physicist, you'll, you'll appreciate this. This tells us that there exists new physics that we really just don't know yet. There is a missing puzzle piece that every time we find new physics, and this happened with both quantum theory and relativity, it makes all sorts of predictions and things that, you know, we, you know, wormholes and, you know, quantum non-locality and all these, all these weird aspects of the universe. And there could be examples of that within this hidden physics that we have no idea what it what, what's going to come out of it, right? If we do figure it out. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think this is one of the, the areas of science that, that doesn't get portrayed to the public well enough is that physicists want to throw their textbooks in the bin, right? I mean, physicists love it when you can either unify previous ideas into a single idea or you could open up a new avenue in terms of direction to go with with regards to physics, because it just means that there are so many more problems that we can we can solve. So this is you know this is one of these great hopes for searching for the the theory of everything, grand unified theories, etc. Is that uh, there will be just so many more things that physics will be able to encompass, and there'll be so many more things we'll be able to understand, and. Where we're at at the moment is that 
we are in a very frustrating situation in the sense that, as I said, we have these two pillars and they both work exceedingly well, right? So, you know, on the quantum mechanical side, we're talking about predictions being born out for like 11 decimal places, right? It, it works. In cosmology, we have a very similar kind of problem in that the, the, the cosmological equations that come out of Einstein's general theory of relativity, they work. They explain the expanding universe. It's, it's incredible how well they work. They also explain you know, GPS. And, in, and for me, you know, the, the discovery back in, uh, is it 2016? I think it must be now, or maybe a little bit earlier. You know, the first gravitational waves, right? That you know, predictions that were made essentially a century before, all born out. And the stuff that relativity predicts, we see. The stuff that quantum mechanics predicts, we see. And we just know that these two theories are not the final answer. They cannot be complete because they just sort of avoid each other. And so um, physicists are desperate for clues to which direction to go in, right? Because if you can imagine, I've got my, my mathematics for either quantum mechanics or relativity. And I'm saying, right, this is not the complete story. Uh, there must be some way to either extend these ideas such that they'll come together one one day, right? But if I give you some mathematics, there's a there's an, an infinite number of ways that you can expand that mathematics, right? If it's just a, an addition, you can just add more terms, you can multiply, or you can add more dimensions to your problem, all this kind of stuff. So people are trying all these different mathematical extensions to these theories and seeing what the predictions are. But what you really need for your scientific theory, of course, is, right, I've now got my my extended version of the mathematics, how can I tell if I'm on the right path? And you tell if you're on the right path by comparing your predictions to what's observed. And what we're finding is that, again, you know, it's just the bare old relativity and quantum mechanics works. This is why people get very excited every time there's, you know, the, the buzzword, right, anomaly, when something looks like it might not quite fit with the standard model of particle physics or with, with the gravitational wave signatures, the physicists get very, very excited. Is this, is this the direction? Of course, as you said, the catch cry is, is new physics. Is this, is this the direction we should be going in? And, you know, as of yet, most anomalies sort of die away when we get more, more data. But it's, it's, it's our big hope in that we can, that something won't fit and we will get an idea of the direction in which to go. And of course, we, we have many things we want to explain, birth of the universe, center of black holes, but there are other things which it, in our cosmological model, the equations work, that's great. But why does the universe have so much dark matter in it? Particle physics doesn't tell us. And what the heck is dark energy, right? I mean, the equations work, but where do these things fit into our fundamental theories? And that's one of the things we would hope that theories of everything could tell us. Now, this evokes history, the history of science, because we once relied entirely upon Newtonian mechanics, you know, the, the physics of Isaac Newton. But over the course of that, people started noticing little discrepancies and things were a little bit off, even though to this day we still use Newtonian mechanics to launch rockets and do all this stuff but it was incomplete, as you said. And that led to general relativity, which, I mean, that's one way to say, okay, we have an incomplete theory, it's mostly right, but there's little discrepancies, but within those discrepancies was general relativity. <laughs> and out pops this gigantic predictive theory that keeps turning out right, correct over and over and over. And the discrepancy with quantum mechanics where general relativity sort of breaks down in the world of the small. Now, if you had to characterize these two theories, which is the stronger one? Is quantum mechanics stronger or is general relativity stronger? It depends what you mean by stronger here, right? Because there are realms where these theories dominate, right? In that no matter what I do with general relativity, it's not going to tell me how one electron talks to another electron, right? So, you know, so quantum mechanics, electrons talking to each other, that's what, what we use. But quantum theory 
can't tell me anything about the expansion of the universe, right? So it can't tell me how the universe is expanding. It can't tell me how gravitational fields are working. So there are regimes where we apply these theories. And so in those regimes, they are the dominant theory, right? When I, in my everyday cosmology, when I want to talk about the expanding universe, I don't really worry that much about quantum mechanics unless I want to add it on as a, an extra process, say I'm looking at nuclear synthesis, the formation of the elements. So then I've got my quantum mechanics doing all the particle stuff in the background of the expanding universe. So I can make those two sort of work together, but they are, are different regimes. The, the, I, I mean, I guess the, you could ask the question of, in terms of strongest, which one is do I think is the direction that we should be going, i.e. should quantum mechanics look more like relativity or should relativity look more like quantum mechanics? And there's a lot of people that think that what we need to do is quantize gravity. I, we have to bring gravity in to the language of quantum mechanics. So, you know, this is various quantum theories that people are trying. String theory is, is again, one of those ones where you want to try and quantize everything. But not everybody agrees that that's the right route, okay? It, there are some that think that maybe it's quantum mechanics is, it's peculiar in certain ways, but it's, but the, it may be the mathematics that we have written quantum mechanics in is, is some sort of approximation of some other kind of mathematics, which matches more nicely with relativity. And I said that uh, at the moment, I wouldn't want to put a bet in it, which one is the more correct theory, if I had to, I would sort of suggest that maybe both need to be modified in that the, the mathematics is, I, I won't say somewhere in between, but it's maybe some sort of mathematical structures we haven't even thought of yet that encapsulate both relativity and quantum mechanics. But I don't think anybody really knows. Now, one of the major developments within physics, developing as we speak, is the possibility of a fifth force of nature which is extraordinary. Now, the existence of a fifth force, should it be proven that there is one, would that lead to insight or could that lead to insight on the nature of gravity and the discrepancies between the two theories? Possibly, possibly. So remember, so the, 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 this fifth force idea, as I said, is, this has come from measurements of uh, like the, the muon gyromagnetic ratio and those kind of experiments. So the question is, if there is a fifth force, right, what does it look like? Now, if I, if I was uh, sitting here and I put my quantum mechanics hat on, right, I would say, well, this fifth force, I'm seeing it to do with uh, muons, which are like heavy electrons. I, could, I can add that fifth force into my quantum mechanical description of forces, right? There, there is a particular language in which you write down the forces and at some level that language always looks the same. So you can, you can add any number of forces you wanted to by just adding the appropriate terms. The question is though, it, does that fifth force agree with that mathematics, right? Is it gonna just go, you know, toe the party line and look like all the other quantum forces, which would suggest that it's got nothing to do with gravity? Or is there something peculiar about this force in that it, it won't obey the mathematics of quantum mechanics and suggests that it's related to something else going on in the universe? At the moment, the problem that we have, of course, is that the, the fifth force, at some level, it's like a ghost force, right? What we're not seeing is the fifth force in action in the same way as you see electromagnetism and the strong force and the nuclear force. We are seeing the influence of, the uh, of this new fifth force, potentially, on a measurement of the spin of, of a particle, which is to do with, you know, the background universe in which the particle finds itself. So we, we, we really need to firstly identify whether or not the fifth force exists. And if it does exist, exactly what is its mechanism? What is the fifth force mediating? What is, what is it acting between? What's its effect? And only when we get to that point are we going to be able to then ask the bigger questions. Well, does it fit neatly into the quantum mechanics bucket? Or is it telling us something else about the universe? Back to the beginnings of the universe. When we look classically at the forces, they unify or we think they unify. 
some of them certainly do. And at, at very high energies, we think they, they all unify, including gravity. But mm -hmm. is there a model where gravity is not a force per se, rather it's something else and doesn't unify? And that the reason that we're having trouble figuring a gravity out is because it isn't a classical force, it's something else. Now, what are the theories regarding that? This, this notion of unification of the forces, uh, you're, you're, you're correct that we already know that the weak force and electromagnetism, two sides of the same coin, that unification has been shown. And the strong force looks like it's, it's playing ball as well. Gravity, however, the, the idea that gravity unifies with the other forces, that's more of a wish than a, an idea, a theory or anything, right? Because without that mathematical framework, we just don't know what happens to gravity in the high energy, energy regimes. There is the possibility, of course, that we do live in a universe where gravity is just separate. No matter how hard we try, we are never going to come up with a quantum theory of gravity. And so that unification picture you, you, were, you were talking about, it may be that gravity just stays over here and does what gravity does, okay? And as I said, because there, there's this, there is a worry with relativity, as with, with quantum mechanics, right? Is that what we're looking at in terms of the mathematics is the approximation or the low energy version of some higher theory, right? So, so that relativity would look different it, it, at higher energies, which is kind of, it's kind of harder to formulate that because energy and, and relativity go together in a really strange kind of fashion. It's, it, it's not easy to talk about relativity in a high energy re regime. But there is this possibility that, yeah, the, the, the mathematics, when we, if we can solve it, if we did have an idea of how gravity behaved in the very early universe, it might look quite different to the picture we have about curved space-time. It might be something else to do with, I mean, there are ide ideas that gravity is something to do with a force across multiple dimensions and all this kind of stuff. We just don't really know. I mean, there are, there are many, many ideas, but again, we're in that state of, you know, you wouldn't be willing to bet your house on any particular one of them being correct. Maybe you bet your car, but not your house. I mean, it, it, it's it's all a bit open. Now, gravity being so mysterious, is it possible that gravity is a phenomenon of another universe leaking into ours, and that's why it's sitting apart? Uh, this is this has been suggested, right? So, uh, as I mentioned, people have talked about gravity acting across multiple dimensions, so, and some people have said, right, maybe what you've got is you've got gravity basically being shared between two universes. And this is why it's overall a weak force, because if you could look at it in the ensemble of universes, it would be strong, but it, it dilutes itself. It's a possible, right? Again, it's a possible. It, it, and, it, you know, it's one of those nice kind of speculative ideas. And people have actually proposed tests, of course. What, what you want to ask is, how does gravity behave on small scales where you know, these dimensions might be very close to each other. And people have asked the question about, you know, if I take neutrons and I drop them, how do they accelerate under gravity? And maybe you will see that there's deviations from what you'd expect from relativity on these very small scales. The problem is, of course, is that you're, you're trying to do an experiment on gravity in the realm where quantum mechanics dominates. And what we know about you know, at that small scale is that it's very hard to come up with an isolated scenario where you could consider things like neutrons dropping and measuring their acceleration due to gravity, because everything then would be influenced in the neutron, right? There might be photons bouncing off it, or it might be in a, you know, a magnetic field, which is affecting its internal spins and all this kind of stuff. So it's very, very hard to do these experiments, and, but, but, but people are trying. Yeah, that's, that's the real trick is experimentation. And, you know, we have these ideas like string theory that might link the two disparate theories. And the problem is, is that good luck testing string theory. You know, this is where, where we get into a problem because any theory we come up with linking the two may be completely untestable. And all we will ever know is that it mathematically predicts correct, right? Yes. Well, I'll give you a slight personal story here. Um, I, I started my undergraduate degree 
1987 at the University of London. And one of my tutors there was Michael Green, who is considered one of the, the fathers of, of string theory. Uh, we were told that, you know, any minute now, any minute now, string theory is going to solve it all, any minute. And here we are sitting, you know, what is it, like 40 years or so later, and we don't seem to have moved that far. And as you said, the, the real problem that we have, well, there's a couple of problems. Number one is that, is that string theory itself has morphed, right? The mathematics of string theory has morphed, and it's morphed into this thing called M theory. And my understanding is that nobody really knows what the M stands for. But M theory is not a single theory. M theory is a collection of mathematical extensions that people are trying to bring together to come up with an overall overarching theorem. And, as, and the real problem is, is that the, the places where you would get predictions that would tell you whether or not string theory slash M theory are correct are just beyond our sort of um, experiments here on Earth, right? The energies involved for um, string theory and M theory to reveal themselves are much greater than the energies that we can produce. But this is why, you know, this notion of... Um, particle cosmology, particle astrophysics, et cetera, has gained a lot of traction because people have realized that, you know, the greatest particle accelerators, the places where energies are the greatest, are out there in the universe, especially in the early universe. And so people are asking the question of, well, maybe is the signature of M theory written into the Big Bang? And then what would that mean for the observations? As of yet, of course, there's been no no clean signal that anybody could point to and say, look, this proves that M theory is correct. But, pe but people are still trying to search for potential observational evidence. But I'd say we might just have to say that this is always going to be beyond our experiments. Speaking of the beyond our experiments, maybe the Big Bang itself is a kind of experiment in the framework of brain theory. Now, what are your thoughts of this idea of colliding membranes, other universes colliding and causing big bangs? Again, I, I think it's, it's an interesting kind of question. The entire picture, again, you, you rapidly step from robust theory into speculation, right? When you talk about these other universes being out there and colliding. But it, it's, it's not completely off the books, right? It, 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 it fits into this notion that maybe our true multiverse or whatever you want to call it, uber universe, is many dimensions. Maybe it's 11 or 23 or whatever the number is in a, in a particular theory. And that would mean that our, un, our universe would be effectively a sheet in there. And why not more, right? And then you can come up with pictures about what happens when these these sheets collide and, you know, you get the creation of, of potentially the creation of new universes. But, you know, it, it, you always have to be very careful of just, you, you have to remember that this is still more speculation than robust theory. It, it as, as I mentioned earlier on, some people have suggested that there, there are patterns in the cosmic microwave background that might indicate such collisions with other universes. But, you know, the statistical significance of these patterns, you know, most people sort of go, no, you know, you're doing the usual thing that humans do, you're seeing patterns in the noise. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, none of it jumps out as being, look, this says that there are other universes floating around in a multidimensional brain out there, but it's a possible. It does have something going for it in that it there is a sort of elegant simplicity to the idea that the multiverse is basically a bunch of parallel clotheslines with sheets pinned to them that occasionally in the wind hit each other. Now, where does yeah. time come into this? Because time is a property of this universe. It begins at the big, the big Bang. And we see, you know, time integral. You know, it's in integral to space. So much so Einstein coined the term space-time. Can there be an analog of time in the multiverse? Absolutely. I mean, the question of where did time begin, right? So I, I'm going to take one slight step sideways here. Physicists don't like talking about time most of the most of the time. They leave it to the philosophers to argue about the, what is time. But, you know, physicists have come up with ideas about is time, you know, as you said, did time begin at the birth of the universe? Or is 
is time emergent in that is it is it time constantly being produced and then the question of whether or not there is time across the larger space-time structure and I, i'm going to put space-time in quotes there because um you know it, it might not look like what we call time in the in the overall picture again it, it's a possible we we could imagine that there is something like what we would call time across the multiverse but the weird thing is is that when you when you come down to it and you even look at time in our universe it really starts to hurt your head quite a bit right because let's just say that einstein was correct right and uh that, that the universe can be described purely in terms of general relativity and you immediately hit this problem, which is which is called the block universe, is that that in relativity, the future exists as much as the past exists, right? It's it's a it's already there. It's a full four dimensional structure, and all we are doing is we're winding our way through this block universe in the same ways that a map is already drawn, and you can just do your path across the map, etc. So in Einstein's picture of the universe, you already run into problems that people, you know, really keep people up at night is that you lose the notion of free will, right? If the future's already written, then, and we're just, you know, following a path thread, so where does free will come into any of this? Which is why then people sort of say, well, well, we need to bring in the quantum mechanical nature of time, and we have this, this notion that um, you know, Carlo Rovelli has written about this time being these like little little seeds and grains that continuously pop up and the universe sort of builds itself into the future. But again, I, I, um, I actually think most physicists are not comfortable with most of these ideas that, you know, I, I, if you sat down a, a room full of physicists and asked, does the future already exist at some sense? They, they wouldn't really know how to vote. So Understanding time in this universe is difficult enough. Understanding time across the multiverse is going to be even more complicated. And in fact, there's, there was a nice bit of work by uh, Max Tegmark. Uh, it must be pushing more than 20 years ago now. But because we can write down our equations of relativity, right, easily enough, you can write in multiple dimensions of time. We know how to do that. And it becomes a very, very complicated universe. If you could imagine that, you've got a universe where there are two time dimensions, then you can, you can play all sorts of tricks, right? You can hide in one time dimension and do stuff thing before going over to the other time dimension. And, and what actually happens is that the entire notion of physics as being a predictive topic, that's right? something that you can make predictions, goes out the window. It, it only really works when we have one dimension of time. And so we're then are left here sitting, well, why is there one dimension of time? Why was that written into the universe, not two or none. And that comes back to that entire fine tuning question that we, we almost started with a while ago. <laughs> so if we entertain ideas like gravity being a force that leaks into this, this universe from another, could time be in the same boat in, in that time leaks into our universe from the multiverse? And does that give us an insight on why the arrow of time is pointing the direction it is? Because it could point backwards, you know, things could go either way. So yeah. would, this, would this provide some sort of moderating force to explain the arrow of time question? Oh, again, you know, we're, we're, this, is, this is something that keeps the philosophers in, in employment for a long, 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 long periods of time. Possibly, right? Again, it, it, it is one of those ideas but you, you, you then still have to ask yourself, what is time in our universe, right? In the relativistic picture, time is already there. It exists past, present, and future is already there. It doesn't leak in from anywhere else. So you'd need to think about how does that time sort of flow in and build the universe? And again, maybe that's sort of related to the pictures like uh, Ravelli have put forward about, you know, this constant buildup of the universe the entire question of the arrow of time though is 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 a, an immense and actually worrying question right because uh we we, we definitely we, we know that our laws of physics in general are time symmetric they work equally backwards and forwards 
yet we experience time in a certain direction, right? Time always points towards the future, whatever points towards the future means, but we know that means things decay, things get older, et cetera. We never see it in reverse. And we have this entire topic of, of thermodynamics and entropy, which sort of talks about, you know, this increasing disorder to the universe. But the, the, nobody knows why time points in the direction it does for us. And, and to, just to, to clarify what I mean by that, right? So let, let's just take Einstein's picture again of the universe, okay? And I said that, you know, we are ma making our way through the universe, da, 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 et cetera. And we, we're following what's known as our world line. And we go from the past to the future. Why do we travel that way? It's because I wrote down in my mathematical equations that I'm going to start traveling this way and I'm going to go travel into the future. There is nothing to stop me making a mathematical choice which is completely valid that I start in the future and I make my way towards the past, right? And in that, if I was doing that, I would basically see the universe running backwards. So, so the question that we sort of have is, is, is why, why then are all our paths starting in the past and heading towards the future? Why, aren't, why haven't we got future people, objects moving towards the past? And this is a question that has really bothered a, a lot of physicists and philosophers. And I think the, the, the sort of hand wavy general kind of solution is that our universe, unlike the laws of physics, our universe is not symmetric in time, right? In the sense that it has a start point, the Big Bang, and there may have been stuff before there, but we won't worry about that. But there's a start point and the universe has been expanding and into the future, it's going to continue expanding and continue expanding. There is not going to be an end like there was a start. And that asymmetry in the overall history of the universe is the thing that wrote the arrow of time into the universe. Now, what that means, again, there's lots of argument about why the, why the universe was born in a, in a low entropy state, right? So to just, just to clarify, right? If our universe had been born instead of there being atoms of hydrogen and helium, it had been born and it, it just created huge black holes everywhere. So no normal matter, but just black holes. That would mean that our universe was born in what's known as a high entropy or highly disordered state. There would not be no useful energy to do anything, right? So you couldn't have life in those kinds of universes. Our universe was born in a state where matter was simple, right? So if you start off with simple matter, you can make more complicated matter, and that's what stars do, so you can produce energy. And it started off with matter being smoothly distributed, right? So that meant things could collapse, so you could release gravitational energy. But why was the universe born in that state of, of low entropy, right? Why, why was it born in that special configuration? And people like Roger Penrose have tried to calculate the, the chances that the universe was born in this kind of state by accident. You get numbers like 10 to the power of 10 to the power of, I don't know, there's some huge factor. It doesn't really matter when you get to those kind of numbers. Chance that that, that was just a, like a random state that the universe found itself in. So again, look, for me, a lot of these questions come back to this fine tuning issue about that the initial conditions of our universe meant that it was low entropy, it meant that it had the potential to go and do stuff. And that somehow is related to the arrow of time. But exactly what this means in terms of other universes and how time behaves and if time flows between universes, I, th I think it's, that's a, a question that we are nowhere near answering at the moment. But there was seemingly at the very moment of the Big Bang, there was something was not quite uniform, meaning that when you look at the cosmic microwave background radiation, you see variations in temperature, very tiny yes. ones. And yes. had those not been there, the universe could have been entirely homogenous, basically atoms spaced equally from each other and nothing ever clumps. So there was a slight tune there that not 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 even getting into life but matter itself this could have been a universe of atoms forever 
Oh, yes. Yet, yet it wasn't. So we're not just talking about the existence to hammer home your point here. We're not just talking about life existing. It's matter itself, stars, galaxies, everything else. The universe is fine tuned for matter to exist, right? That, that's right. So, so, the, so those lumps in the cosmic microwave background, they are thought to come from this period at, at around 10 to the minus 35 seconds, which is known as inflation, right? So this is, the universe has this sort of like hiccup where it increases by like 80 orders of magnitude in size. It, it takes a tiny fraction of a second and some sort of quantum pattern gets written into the universe, right? Due to inflation. You're right that that pattern, if that pattern had come out and it was too smooth, then matter would have never collapsed into uh, stars and galaxies. So it, it would just be a wash with dilute gas throughout the universe. But the flip side as well is, is that if that pattern had been stronger, it's, it's of order one part in 10 to the five. If that pattern had been stronger, then after the Big Bang, we would have started off again with atoms, but things would have collapsed very, very quickly and you would have basically formed black holes. So you would have rapidly gone from this situation where you have almost dilute material into black holes very, very quickly. So again, we, we seem to have come out with this, this inhomogeneity in the early universe at, at, at a nice level for the creation of stars and galaxies and uh, for there to at least be a span of the universe before matter gets turned into black holes where the universe can host complexity in life. So again, yeah, as I said, uh, I'm one of those that, you know, everywhere you look, you start to see there are fine tuning issues that, that lead to complexity in life in the universe that we don't know the answer to, right? Because if inflation had gone on for longer, then you would have gotten a very different outcome. And if it had happened a lot shorter as well, you would have gotten a very different outcome to the one that we, we actually have in our universe today. So without the existence of a multiverse, and that this is a true universe, meaning it is all that is, was, and ever will be, as the classical description of it goes, in a one universe model, the anthropic principle starts looking very spooky. And to evoke the philosophers again, the idea of it being a simulation, do you think oh, yeah. that has legs? Oh, yeah, yes. Look, I, I'm... I, I... I, I, I'm going to say I like, and I'm going to put air quotes around the word like, I like the notion of the simulation hypothesis, right? So this is this notion that we are actually a, a computer simulation. One of, one of the things I do in my day job with, with well, my students is that we generate synthetic universes, right? So we study the evolution of flow of matter in universes with computer simulations. And this notion of the simulation hypothesis that as our computers get bigger and faster, our simulations get better, that, you know, what if our simulations get to the point where we can actually have consciousness within our simulations? Although exactly how we would know uh, is, is another question altogether. So does sort of fit in the philosophical kind of picture that this universe could be a simulation? Now, one of the things that I think is kind of interesting is, is what, what was the simulation being run for, right? So, you know, there are people that say, oh, the simulation hypothesis, that's, they're, they're simulating us, right? It, we, we are in the matrix or whatever you, you want to put it. But if you think about it, it, it could be that the, the, the great simulator in the universe above is just exploring different kinds of physics, right? So whatever the physics they've got in their universe, they are saying, right, well, what if I consider universes that have only three dimensions of space and one of time? And they've looked through and they said, oh, well, if I have this mix of physics and that mix of physics, that's going to be a boring simulation. Why would I do that? I'm going to simulate interesting universes where I can get complexity, etc. And maybe we are not the sort of central aspect of the simulation. Right? We are a byproduct of the simulation that the, the great simulator in the sky doesn't care about us, doesn't even know about us. We are just part of the simulation and they are more interested in just looking at, you know, how many giant stars are there, how many M dwarf stars or whatever the, their view is. And so the, 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 the motives behind the simulation and we, we, we of course may never imagine what the, that mind may be like anyway, 
might have nothing to do with this, which I, I think is not the way a lot of people look at the simulation hypothesis. And of course, there's the prospect then as well is, is if it is a simulation, what if they get bored, right? You know, and they've just flicked the switch, then that's, you know, the, the end of the end of the, the universe is because oh, they thought, oh, I've got enough for my homework assignment. I, I'm going to go off and do something else now. Now let's go forward trillions and trillions of years. And I think the, 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 uh, <laughs> My favorite scenario that I've come up with just pondering the idea of simulated universes is the idea of a Boltzmann brain, you know, in a, an infinitely aging universe that's gone black, but all of a sudden just out of, out of the ether comes this thinking something, you know, maybe a quantum supercomputer existing just briefly. And it looks around at that black universe, that dead universe, and it asks itself, what was this once like? So it sparks off a simulation. And, you know, you could never, you could never prove anything like that, but it's a fun science fiction scenario. But going into the very, very far future, do you think that we just live in an infinite universe that's just going to age forever in blackness, eventually cold and blackness? Or do you favor any of the theories like the big rip or big freeze or anything like that? What do you think will end this? Okay, so if we take our cosmological picture as we understand it, right, which is currently 70% dark energy, 30% matter, of which dark matter is the big dominant component. And I, we can run our universe into the future. We, we know essentially what's going to happen based upon the laws of physics as we understand them, right? So we know that stars are going to shine for roughly uh, 100 trillion years, okay? And that's when eventually the stars will go out. Then after that, things become slightly more speculative because you've got this entire question about proton stable. And if you have proton decay, then around 10 to the 40 years, that's when matter sort of melts away. And then if Hawking was right about Hawking radiation about uh, 10 to the 100 years, that's when black holes will finally evaporate. And you're left with that infinite universe, which is filled with nothing but electrons, positrons and photons, but it's diluting and diluting and diluting. So in terms of the universe, as we understand it, that it's heading for that, that, that heat death, as it's called, right? The, the ultimate high entropy version of the universe, no potential to do anything whatsoever. But there are some big caveats in that, right? Now, so number one is, is that dark energy, right, has particular properties to it. We know that it's causing the expansion of the universe to accelerate. And that's because it has a particular, you know, it's, we, we call it the equation of state. It's, it's energy density versus its sort of tension. Now, what if on the huge time scales of the universe that the dark energy changes its spots in the sense that, you know, given uncountable number of years into the future, dark energy stops being what it is now and, and transforms into something else. Now, again, I can write down the equations for that, but I don't know if they apply to dark energy that we have in our universe, but it, it, it's a possible thing. There are, there are other, and if that happens, then you could get, as you said, a big rip scenario, but that would just basically end, end the universe and it would just eventually become a dead heat death universe sooner if you have a big rip. I think that one of the more interesting things though is dark energy is a, is a certain amount of energy for every cubic meter and it's an energy field in the universe, right? So we, we know it's there. And some people have speculated maybe again on immense time scales, right? The, remember, it's a field in the universe. It's governed by the laws of quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics allows energy levels to spontaneously change from one to another through, through quantum tunneling, right? That allows you to go from one state to another. And there is the potential that dark energy could do this again on an immense time scale, 10 to the 10 to the whatever number of years. The dark energy could undergo a transition and go from one energy state to another. And if it does that, then that would mean that that, that transition could kick off effectively another version of the inflation that we had in our early universe. So you could get this bout of energy being released rapid expansion, then that energy being released back into the universe, and it's no longer in the form of dark energy anymore, that energy gets transformed through a process in our universe called reheating into matter and radiation. 
So you, you could imagine that um, in the far future of the universe, instead of the universe just cooling to infinity, that there's this transition, a burst of inflation, and the universe or universes are born again, right? There's new universes that are formed out of this transition of energy. And, they, they, you know, who knows exactly what will be in them, whether it be matter and radiation like in ours, etc. And there are some that have speculated that that may be where our universe came from, right? That the universe has already been through this cycle of birth, almost eternal life to some sort of heat death and then rebirth again and off you go. So it, again, it's it's a possible, and I like I like to try and be an optimist in the, in the sense that, you know, you wouldn't want to think that the ultimate future is just a cold and dead universe and that there is a prospect whereby there, there will be this cosmic rebirth some point in the future. All right, Doctor, it's been a fascinating discussion and we are out of time, but oh. uh, your new book, Where Did the Universe Come From? Where can everybody get that? From your online bookstores, uh, it, it is available more or less everywhere. I believe as well in, in the US, uh, it, there's copies in every, in the, uh, what's, your, what's the name of your big bookstore there? I've forgotten the name. Oh, that we still have them? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, um, yeah, I think there's uh, Barnes & Noble, I think it is. Barnes & Noble, that's the word I was looking for, yes. I believe that they, they actually are going to have physical copies uh, uh, there as well. All right, Doctor, thanks for joining us, and I hope we can do this again sometime. Uh, thank you for having me, and would love to come back on the show. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science John. Fiction Author. Wrong channel. No, it's not. Thanks for listening. I am Futurist and Science Fiction Author John Michael Godier, currently hosting Event Horizon and wondering where Anna actually came from. One day I had a tablet computer, the next I had a boss. Very disturbing. Be sure. And that's enough of that. YouTuber forever. Like, subscribe, and hit the bell. Sell out. What? <laughs>